Okay, so um, my name is Professor Beck, and I'm going to be your teacher for World Philosophies this second summer session starting tomorrow night. Um, <clears throat> July, June 28th. So that's where we're at. And I think we have these following students, Alisa, Colin, Ryan, Michael, Alexis, Timothy, and Wesley. So if you are one of those, I invite you into the class. I really enjoy teaching this class. It doesn't bother me that it's online, so I hope it doesn't bother you. There are few enough students that you should expect to be called on twice during the class, at least. So I'd like it to be a discussion where really um, my goal would be that I would step back and you would talk to each other. <laughs> um, because I do think in our society now, people aren't talking to each other. And I moved to a different place and I'm realizing more and more that the society is structured so that people really can just find their comfort zone and they don't have to talk to anybody they disagree with. So in my classes, I, students might disagree, but you should value that because it's not good for people to get stuck in their little silo. I mean, the point of liberal arts education is to have conversations with people from different perspectives. Um, so in the Lion College catalog, there are five characteristics of a liberally educated person. And the 26, 27 years that I taught at Lyon, I tried to keep those five characteristics in mind. And I tried to encourage them in my students. So the characteristics are intellectual honesty. That means that what you don't know you don't think you know either. So I, I have a lot of students that seem to think they know things they don't know. And um, so, and then some students think, well, to believe something is to accept it without evidence. Well, that's fine, but I don't think, our founding fathers would not want you to base your your political views on something that has no evidentiary basis for which there's no evidence. Because our founding fathers said separated church and state. So when you're thinking like a religious believer, you can accept things without evidence. But when you're thinking like a citizen, you must think you must tie your conclusions, not only to facts, but to sufficient evidence. And many times you should stay open, say, as far as I know, this is what I, what I think based on the evidence I know, but I could be wrong and I'm open to new evidence. So intellectual honesty is really important, and it's a big problem in our country. Um, commitment to truth. So I do think there is such a thing as truth. Um, I do think that societies can construct belief systems that are lies, they're false. But just because they're very powerful and societies construct them doesn't mean they're true. For example, sexism. Societies have con been constructed on the belief that women are by nature inferior, but 
no matter how powerful that was, it was always wrong. Same with racism, um, same with um, ethnicity, as um, people are morally superior or inferior based on their ethnicity. No, <laughs> that's just a lie. So commitment to truth is really important. Fairness to opposing points of view. So people can be committed to truth and intellectually honest and disagree. And so you have to be fair when people, uh, people have different points of view. Then patience with complexity and ambiguity. So most of the problems we deal with are complex and ambiguous. It's difficult. The facts can lead to different conclusions. So oversimplifying what you think, trying to make it simpler than it is, is a big mistake. And a liberal, liberally educated person should refuse to oversimplify um, in their opinions about political things, social things, how we get along with each other. And the last one is tolerance of reasoned dissent. So you can disagree with somebody, but if they're intellectually honest, they're committed to truth, they're fair, they're patient with complexity, you just tolerate that because you can always open up the conversation in the future when that more data is gathered. So these are five qualities I would like you to work on. And the reason is we're so polarized, right? Our country is very polarized right now. And I don't think students enjoy that. I certainly hope they don't, but it will cost them in the future. Um, I don't think you want to try and govern to be leaders 20 years from now, if the country is this polarized, because it's really impossible to lead. So, so in order to get over polarization, you just engage in meaningful dialogue and maintain that open mind. So liberal education means being liberated from prejudging, prejudice, from narrow-mindedness, from judgmental, from uh, believing things that you don't have evidence for. Anyway, all of that is a why we have a liberal arts education. So the syllabus is here. And these are just the standard documents. I have on here the time 7.30 to 9, but, and I'm going to meet you tomorrow from 7 to 9, because this video is shorter and we can get started. But if we start at 7, maybe some students might come late. We could also quit a little earlier. Okay, I will have office hours right after class, or if you want um, and to make an appointment, these are required texts. Please order them if you haven't ordered them by now. So the first couple, well, the first week will be on something I, I have attached, but then you have to buy the book because it just violates copyright laws. Um, if, if I scan it and post it, um, so my students in Bangladesh, they figured out how to pirate books and stuff because they're poor and this is how they survive. But American students, these are, you can get them used. It's not a lot of money. So I have scans of a number of things, but there's three books I would like you to order. Then we have these learning outcomes um, and it's a lot of words. I do want you to um, 
you know, be able to read and the quality of your papers. So at the end of the semester, the, the month, I will ask you, do you think you got better at these um, outcomes? And so you can just think about it, let me know. Um, reading, um, writing a paper, having a clear th thesis statement, um, having arguments, paragraphs, that sort of standard stuff for English class. Um, communicate your ideas orally, okay? And we don't have small groups in this class because the whole class is small enough, but you will have to communicate orally. I'll call on you probably twice per class. In respect to the content of the papers, um, you can, I hope that over the course of the month, your papers will become more complex, more creative, um, you'll be thinking, you'll be synthesizing the material for the class, coming up with your own thesis, and being able to defend it in a more complete way. So, and you really have to have read the material, right? Because it's not like math or science, it's not clear cut, you have to know each step, but you, they, the, the lectures do fit together into a whole. And I have themes from Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism. There's themes like, what's the view of reality? What's the ethics view? What is their position on the environment? What's the position on women? And so when the more you know, the more you can keep in mind of what we've covered, the more complex and creative and your thesis statements will be. Now, the religion and philosophy program emphasizes the union, the, a link between reason, which means reasoning, drawing a conclusion and giving an argument, scientific method and social science, any of those, and then faith, can be defined as either your idea of human flourishing, what is a good life? So it's your ultimate values, or it could be some, your religious views, uh, and it could be Confucian or Hindu or Buddhist or some mixture of them. I've had students that are uh, Wicca, pagan, neo-pagan, um, Buddhist, Baha'i, Hindu, uh, Dudist from the great Lebowski movie, which I didn't see, but, you know, I had a student, I had a student who was a Satanist. Like I, you know, I like philosophy because there's no limit to where you can start. It's just that you have to give arguments. You have to explain explain to me why you think that's the best way to look at the world. Um, you have to tie it down with arguments. Then the last thing, oh yeah, is these qualities of a liberal mind. Um, so the content, intercultural knowledge, um, that you're literally starting to create history, right? Once you get to college, that's why I like teaching college, you're, you've broken away from habits, imitating. You're basically, you don't have a lot of choices um, in high school. And most of the people you know are people you met just because of where you lived. It wasn't, you didn't have a lot of choice. When you get to college, you have a lot of choice. So um, you're creating yourself and you're creating your history. And we're gonna live in a very globalized world. So you do need to constantly be expanding your mind. You're integrating different things. I will teach you how all of these, each tradition has a relation to science, uh, politics and art. Okay, Confucianism. Each of these is a whole worldview that incorporates all aspects 
of human culture. Um, you make choices about how you want to live. You make more informed decisions about ethical reasoning. Um, and civic engagement, how you would like to get involved in public life. Um, my teaching strategy is to try and start with asking you, what do you think? So each class, we start out when you're reading, when you're preparing for class, you write down um, two, three things that you want to make sure we cover in class. And so that's then you start, each student goes through the first thing. And then at the end, I'll make sure and make a point of what I what else I wanted you to think about that led me to cause to read to assign those readings. Attendance is really important. So in this one, in summer school, as you know, I think one day is like a week. So please, uh, you need to be attentive. Um, you need to send an email. Um, and you need to send it by, well, hopefully even before the class, you can tell me you're not gonna make it to class for some reason, but uh, please notify me as soon as you can. Here's the general structure for absences. And each class here is equal to two. I'll just do two rather than three, but um, you really need to <laughs> make it to class. And I know it's hard. I know a lot of you work, but you know, it's a class. Um, each class is supposed to be two and a half hours today, a day. So we're going to do one and a half in person and one online. Um, OK, you present what you have to say. Um, tardy, again, <laughs> just don't come late. Written assignments. Um, every Saturday, you need to submit a post. It'll have 150 words for each class day, um, for each class. And there are two parts for each day. So, um, so if we have five classes in a day, in a week, some of the weeks are four classes and some are five. So let's assume five. Five classes, class number one, 150 words. Uh, half of that is the questions or comments you have before class starts. The other half are comments you had about what other people said in class, what was covered in class. So the first part you need to write before class and the second part you need to write after class. So here's the Monday class, has a total of 150 words, about half of it comments before class, about half of it comments about the class, then Tuesday the same, Wednesday the same. So it's 150 words times five, 750 words. And then you post it because I have the classroom assignments um, on the Google Classroom. I can show you that. A paper is due. So again, this is a lot of work. I know it is. Every Saturday morning, you post, submit a post, and then every Sunday night, you have a paper due. Um, I have the paper topics posted, and then that should always include, am I gonna put this in my final paper? Then you have a final paper, and it's due. The last day of class is June 29th. You need to present an outline. The following day, the paper is due, because the following day, the grades are due. So I am sorry about that. <laughs> Here's the penalty for late papers. Otherwise, you're just never gonna, you're gonna get behind and it's gonna be really bad. <laughs> if you're thinking of majoring in religion and philosophy, 
you um, keep a portfolio, make a file with your original worldview, one other paper, and the final paper. Okay, so here's how I organize the class. Two hours of study per hour of class. Um, here's the honor code policy, plagiarism. I hope you have gone through all of that. Uh, sexual misconduct, harassment, all of that stuff. So here we are, the last day to drop is June 30th, so that comes really quickly. And the last day to drop with a W is July 12th. So that's the syllabus. Then I have the list of readings for each class. And I'll show you here how that's organized. Well, you can see here's the first day of class, syllabus, schedule, speaking rubric, paper rubric, and religion. So here it is right here. First class, June 28th. Here's all the attachments. So then you go back to this list. The second class, Athens, rise and fall, notes, PowerPoint, timeline, Greek deities. So you go there and you see, oh, there's the second class, right? And so that's how it is. I, I think I've got everything Knock on wood, <laughs> I think I've got everything posted and I think I've got the dates there. Um, but on a, on a day like this, June 30th, you have to do this and you have to do this or part of this. So again, it's very condensed, but I'm at least going to assign the same thing I assigned for the students in the regular class, but um, you just do the best you can. So here's the material we're gonna cover. We'll cover Athens, one of Plato's dialogues about what is what does it mean to be pious or righteous, um, a holy person, a person whose virtue is connected to holiness in some way. Then there's um, the Apology and the Crito. Those are all Platonic dialogues. And I also have news articles related to the themes in the dialogue. Okay, then we have Aristotle's virtues. I think this is the first week is Plato. Then we have Aristotle. And we have some articles on um, the brain, the way the brain is wired is very consistent with the values of religions, though at least the way we're going to study them. And then we also cover um, revenge, depression, and stress. And we're covering it in a mind-body way that there's a connection between how you think, your ideas, and your brain chemistry, how your brain is actually being formed. There's neural maps in your brain and you can literally break some apart and form new ones. Um, stress and depression. Air, okay, then we have a paper. So at the end of the, the papers are due on Sundays. So for example, the Crito is um, the last reading of the week. You hand in your post on Saturday morning. Then you write a paper on Plato um, and hand that in Sunday night. And then on Tuesday, I'll have you present those papers. OK, so then we have um, political virtues, speaking, uh, talking about management, leadership, um, your your engagement in the society, the United Nations, women's rights, humanism. So um, all of our founding fathers, or almost all of them, were actually humanists. Um, some of them were Episcopalian humanists, Christian humanists. Um, I guess most all of them were Christian humanists. 
So we read about the humanist tradition. Um, and then we read Martin Luther King, his letter from a Birmingham jail. We read, um, you have, excuse me, you have to find your own favorite kind of humanism. If you're thinking of going into medicine, there's um, humanistic doctors, humanism and medicine, humanism and teaching, humanistic psychology, all these things. Then we talk about Confucius, and that's another one of your books. So the book that has stress, depression, the biology of the spirit, that's one book you have to buy. Um, then we have another book, uh, Houston Smith's World, World Religions, and that has Confucius, read about Confucius, read some of Confucius' Analects. You find out that the US founding fathers really liked Confucius, <laughs> Hinduism. And then we start having these uh, same themes. So we take Aristotle's virtues and I point out that every one of these traditions is trying to encourage the cultivation of those virtues, the same virtues. So we do Hinduism, and we also start talking about Hinduism and women, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. We'll talk about their positions on women, their positions on art, and their positions on the environment. So then we have Buddhism. We compare it to Aristotle's virtues and Jesus' virtues in the Sermon on the Mount. And then we have the physiology, the way a religion affects your brain, your brain chemistry, Buddhism and women, Buddhism and the environment. Um, then we have Islam and Muhammad, Jesus, and Buddha, and Socrates actually is there too. Then we have the Quran um, and Islam and women, Islam and terrorism, Islam and environment. Then I have some pretty pictures about my experiences in Indonesia. And then we have science and religion. So we read from some quantum physicists and some, um, let's see. Oh, yeah, a mathematician who is an atheist and um, Einstein's view of God. So then you have your final paper. And I think actually I changed it to 1500 words. So you can cut that down a little bit. Um, and that's, that's what the material we're going to cover. Here's the something for you to think about. In your worldview, what's your what what is your worldview, and then how would you identify yourself? Are you just not interested in thinking about having a worldview? They don't care. A second pattern is that students just accept whatever they were taught. Um, they're authority figures, and they can't really answer why. Like, I've always believed this way. Um, then there's the moratorium, the searchers, who um, they're re-examining their beliefs, and they're criticizing some of them or adapting some others, but for their own reasons, not because their mother said so. It's because they think so. Um, and then there's the path makers, people who have found a new path, and they can articulate a worldview that's different from the one they grew up with. It doesn't have to contradict it. It's just bigger, and it gives reasons based on science or um, truth, some notion of truth instead of because my mother said so. I mean, I was a mother, so I appreciate if a kid does what their mother says, but ultimately they have to do it for their own reasons and for the right reasons. 
Um, this is the speaking rubric. So when you present, um, especially in the more formal presentations of your papers, but you know, it's good for you to come prepared, be organized, um, that you deliver things well, um, that you know the subject matter and that you have a central message or a thesis. So this is, you know, this is mostly relevant for papers, not daily presentations, but there is constantly oral presentation. And then this is the paper rubric. So when you start writing your papers, hopefully I'll, I mean, I plan to make a video like this one, the a day or two before the papers are due so that it's, you know, you can talk it through. It's not, I'm not gonna say a lot more than is right in there. So if you wanna look at this, and then if you have questions, you can come to class with your questions. Um, okay, so when we have class, I will, after we go through these logistics, I will also have, um, I will start talking about Greece. So let's see if there's anything I, else. I don't know, I think that's it. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at seven o'clock. And then after that, at 7.30, unless students decide together, everybody decides that they would prefer an earlier time or a later time, whatever they can commit to, I'm happy I can adjust. All right. Um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.